next contribution is from Roger Walker of the European Space Agency. Uh, he gave a, a talk this morning at the very well-attended specialist meeting. His title is The Rise of CubeSats from Educational Tools to Operational Systems. Thank you, John. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invitation to talk at the Society here. Very much appreciated. I'm going to talk about something uh, a little bit different, actually, uh, probably from what you're familiar with uh, at the Society here. CubeSats, um, you may not know much about CubeSats, and if we don't get some slides up, you might not <laughs> know much either. <laughs> um, just to say, uh, CubeSats, let's say, are very small satellites, as, an as by way of an introduction. Uh, nanosatellites, so-called, um, because they are typically uh, having a, a mass of about 10 kilograms, and the dimensions are on the tens of centimetres scale, so very small satellites and uh, satellites that have only recently in the, the last few years been actually launched into space and used for the first time. And uh, where all great things come from, I would say, uh, universities have actually invented CubeSats. Uh, it was invented in 2001 by <laughs> Professor Bob Twiggs at uh, Stanford University really as a means to educate uh, students in space systems engineering and uh, space technology. So um, since about, about that time, uh, it was a very humble beginning, but uh, we've had now more than 500 of these small satellites actually launched into space, and not only for, um, for educational purposes, now more also for um, other purposes as well, which I'll addressing the subject of my talk here. So just to give you a summary, um, typically we see uh, for CubeSats, this was the beginning where we had a one unit CubeSat. So one unit is basically a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters box, one liter volume, typically around one kilogram. A lot of these uh, satellites have actually been launched. There have also been two and three unit CubeSats. These have also been extensively launched by universities. And now we're starting to see the first six-unit uh, CubeSat to be launched by China uh, actually last year, and very soon 12-unit uh, CubeSats. So there's a whole variety of volumes and form factors, and uh, that's been now uh, something which has been taking hold in the space sector. It's a very dynamic uh, new area of the space sector. Why are people interested in them? Well, particularly that... Um, the, uh, the components used in these very small satellites are um, pretty much coming from terrestrial uh, electronics and a miniaturization of electronics particularly, and sensors. A lot of the electronics and sensors that you, we would actually fly in CubeSats, uh, you, will, you will actually see that in uh, smartphones in your pocket. So it's that um, miniaturization revolution in electronics and sensors which has actually been exploited for the space domain. And what we now have is not only very small spacecraft um, performing all the classical functions of a spacecraft, but also uh, doing that at very low cost and very quick to manufacture. So the manufacturing costs is very low because they're low in mass as well. Um, the, the cost of actually launching a, a spacecraft into space is normally on a per kilogram basis, so the launch costs are very low. And typically, uh, very short development timescales can be achieved with small teams. So we have the possibility to actually uh, uh, basically uh, conceive of a mission and get it up into space within one to two years. Even. Um, sometimes it's three years, depending on the complexity. But in space project terms, that's very fast. And I would, I would say, particularly for uh, scientific measurements, uh, which what you, you may be interested in, um, that offers uh, scientific researchers the possibility to get frequent data for, for their purposes, um, particularly for observations of various uh, phenomena, which I'll get onto. Um, there is also quite a high availability of launch opportunities, so these very small sats that get uh, a piggyback ride on the larger launch vehicles, which are, are launching uh, 
the usual large satellites. The way things have evolved over time, we've had uh, since 2001 the invention of the CubeSat that's become very popular. Uh, that's, as I said, for hands-on education, but we've had now a second wave coming, a so-called experimental wave, where uh, actually uh, small industry have popped up around the world, also in Europe, and uh, space agencies such as ESA, NASA, and, uh, and others are actually using these small systems for technology demonstration very cheaply and very quickly in order to um, actually accelerate the, the um, technology evolution, let's say, in space systems. And that's actually leading to the possibility now of uh, a third wave, which is uh, what I would call an operational wave, where we're starting to see in the coming years the possibility to actually use these small systems not only for tech demo but also operationally for um, constellations of, of these small satellites, deploying those in low Earth orbit for various purposes, also for close proximity operations. Um, the capabilities now are becoming such that uh, it will be possible very soon to actually do a, a completely autonomous rendezvous and docking of these small systems and also fly uh, formations, so uh, swarms of these small systems. So collectively, uh, one might expect that these small swarms could operate as a, um, an interferometric array for scientific measurements even. Then there's been some recent work uh, by NASA, ourselves, and others for looking at uh, how to use these small systems for beyond uh, low Earth orbit science. And that's opening up some very exciting possibilities, I think, for um, particularly for small, uh, small body uh, asteroid science. Just to say what we're doing uh, in the domain, we've launched our first CubeSat last, uh, uh, well, 2015. It re-entered the atmosphere last year. It had a one-year uh, flight in orbit. You can see it uh, actually in the center here. It's a three units CubeSat. And that was developed um, in order to test a number of technologies including uh, even basic uh, capabilities. So where we came from in the past, these CubeSats more or less 10 years ago went beep and tumbled a bit in orbit, doing not much. Now we have the possibility to actually uh, control and stabilize the attitude of the satellites in three axes, uh, actually transmit data to the ground in X band, so frequencies of around eight gigahertz, and that's uh, uh, really improving the possibility to downlink lots of data from these small systems. And on the payload side, we've actually demonstrated software-defined radio technologies where it's actually possible to receive uh, virtually any radio signal um, on these types of small satellites um, just by simply programming software and uploading it to the satellite. So very flexible. There are a number of other ones in development. Um, that includes uh, our next satellite to be launched in August. Uh, that will be demonstrating the possibility to actually manoeuvre the satellite with some propulsion on board and actually um, transmit data between two satellites in orbit to get data back very quickly. There will be also a hyperspectral imager um, flown. So this is, would you believe, uh, a small optical instrument which you can hold in the palm of your hand, but it's actually able to, to measure uh, or take images um, with many spectral bands to a spectral resolution of about 10 nanometers uh, in the visual and near-infrared range. Also, there will be um, another mission flown for uh, re-entry research. It will actually measure the plasma during re-entry, which has never been done before. Another mission called Picasso coming up uh, will actually perform a demonstration of the technology for atmospheric science. It will actually point uh, an imager at the Earth's uh, atmospheric limb and um, perform observations of the sun through the Earth's atmosphere during sunset and sunrise. And by doing that, it, it's possible to uh, look at the uh, particular absorption band, the Chappius band, and uh, actually determine and infer the vertical profiling of, of stratospheric ozone to about 5% uh, accuracy. Then there'll be uh, a mission to actually um, demonstrate the technology for measuring the total solar irradiance and the Earth radiation budget, comparing the two in order to try to characterize the Sun-Earth radiation imbalance. 
We've also got missions for uh, demonstrating future operational technologies and also a very interesting one to actually take in situ uh, measurements of the radiation environment in space and uh, the magnetic field. So we'll actually be measuring uh, energy spectra of protons, electrons and uh, cosmic rays plus the magnetic field. What's making all this possible is a technology uh, revolution, if you like, in attitude control for performing uh, scientific measurements. You want to point your payload at a, uh, your target of interest. Previously, we've only had uh, accuracies possible of around 10 to 20 degrees, but now there's been a lot of miniaturization done in star trackers and uh, miniaturized reaction wheels. Putting those two together, we can actually achieve pointing accuracies of around 0.2 degrees. So that means you can start to actually perform some decent scientific measurements. As I said, for communications, uh, with the evolution of the technology going to ever higher frequencies, it's possible to um, get more scientific data back from these missions, which is really overcoming uh, a big limitation of the past. Propulsion-wise, uh, cold, uh, cold gas propulsion is being developed. So basically, uh, microelectromechanical um, technology is being used to miniaturize thrusters. You can see something as uh, big as a 50 euro cent coin here. This is basically the thruster head, and it just um, actuates a valve which expels gas through a nozzle. It's as simple as that, but it's only recently been possible thanks to silicon etching technology. And this is being used to actually maneuver satellites in orbit and enable uh, six degree of freedom control of uh, satellites relative to other satellites and opening up, as I said, formation flying possibilities. Then there's some quite exciting developments going on with electric propulsion technology. Um, I will just highlight the main one here for the future, which is miniaturized gridded iron thrusters. These are able to um, deliver a very small thrust um, with a power of about 70 watts. So we might expect a thrust of about 1.7 millinewtons here. So just a gentle push on the spacecraft. But that's very, very fuel efficient. So the specific impulse here is over 3,000 seconds. And that enables uh, something like a 12 unit CubeSat to have uh, a velocity change in flight of around three kilometers per second. And based on our studies uh, very recently, we, we believe <coughs> that makes it feasible to actually go and rendezvous with asteroids that are very close to Earth. So actually, in the coming four, week, four years, we would expect uh, small CubeSats to be able to visit and rendezvous with asteroids and characterize them for scientific purposes. Then there are uh, navigation uh, technologies which are also useful, and that's particularly um, relevant for, again, when uh, these small systems would visit uh, asteroids. So Asteroids are obviously very big, uncontrolled objects, and one needs to navigate very close to them. So there are some good miniaturization that has been done in miniaturized LIDAR, where we see actually um, the, the possibility to uh, measure the distance relative to the asteroid as the, the, the spacecraft is flying very close. Optical payloads, again, that's been a lot of uh, development done recently, as I said, with hyperspectral and uh, multispectral imagery. Very recently, there have been some quite interesting developments in instruments for um, nitrogen dioxide measurements, and that's particularly relevant for uh, the UK because there's been the University of Leicester developing that. It would be possible then uh, to measure with a resolution of about 500 meters uh, NO2 content on the ground, and that's particularly uh, relevant for um, pollution in city areas, so we know very well that pollution is a problem and NO2 is a great source of pollution so being able to characterize that is, uh, is important for, for the future. RF payloads as well, um, just to highlight here that um, with simply by receiving signals from GPS and Galileo constellations it's possible to actually uh, measure terrestrial uh, tropospheric variables, temperature, pressure and humidity and uh, by the bending angle of the, uh, of the signals through the atmosphere. And then we have the possibility to feed that data into numerical weather prediction models. So that, this is a, a, a source of uh, data 
which will lead to improved weather prediction and space weather prediction, of course. Future applications. As I said, these uh, uh, systems are very uh, useful when flown uh, in a large number. So we have a distributed system consisting of uh, potentially up to 30, 40 spacecraft orbiting the Earth. And we've got the, the possibility then to have a very high spatiotemporal coverage, uh, either of, uh, for instance, ship or aircraft traffic, or um, uh, let's say content of nitrogen dioxide over the diurnal cycle, um, tracking the, the ionospheric uh, variabilities, sea surface states, and so on. So this is a very cost-effective way to be able to, uh, to do that. Then, as I said, we have swarm formations. Actually, that will uh, open up the possibility with uh, swarm formation flying to actually perform uh, multi-static synthet synthetic aperture radar measurements for remote sensing. And quite tantalizingly, I think, uh, when such a system could be deployed in a lunar orbit uh, or further away from the Earth to actually conduct low frequency radio astronomy uh, in an interferometric array where one could actually look at uh, radio waves uh, coming from uh, the galaxy, for instance, or from the cosmic dark ages for, for cosmological studies. And uh, it, of course, in the 10 to, to 20 uh, megahertz frequency range. I won't go on to this too much, but just to say for close proximity operations, we're looking into actually using the possibility to dock CubeSats to build up larger space structures in the future. Uh, autonomously, so you don't have, wouldn't have to carry everything in one go as, as a monolithic uh, spacecraft inside a launch vehicle anymore. It may be possible in the future to actually do some building on orbit with these uh, types of small systems. Then going beyond low Earth orbit for science and exploration purposes, um, there's the possibility to uh, piggyback these on launches to highly elliptical Earth orbits. So geostationary transfer orbit, for instance, that will be interesting for making astrobiology measurements, the effects of the radiation environment on uh, astrobiology uh, samples, into lunar orbit and uh, Lagrange points. So we may start from there to go to the moon with these CubeSats or to asteroids to study them for, for scientific purposes. So just in my conclusions, it's a relatively young field, obviously uh, evolving very dynamically at the moment. We've only had uh, really uh, less than 20 years of this since we uh, started out in, in, the, uh, in the field with CubeSats since 2001. Since then, we've had ho over 500 launched into space. They've been adopted widely by industry, research institutes, academia for, um, for particularly um, hands-on education and technology demonstration purposes. The main advantage is our low cost and rapid schedule. Of course, we've started out uh, the activities at ESA in education and technology uh, particularly. And uh, really, the, the near-term developments that are going on in the miniaturized technology domain, not only specifically in space, but uh, um, around the world as a whole, terrestrially, of being spun into these small, small systems to make them actually do more and actually conduct science at a low cost uh, and, and on a frequent basis, which is what we may expect in the future. They're not the solution to everything, but I would say they have their place for future science, okay. Earth observation, telecommunications, uh, space, space weather, space situational awareness <coughs> in low Earth orbit and, uh, and also beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much for getting us back on schedule. Um, th there's one word you didn't mention, which astronomers tend to use quite a lot, and that is aperture. Aperture, yes. Aperture. I isn't that the fundamental limitation, at least for astronomical and, I guess, some geophysical applications? You're absolutely right. Um, for for ast astronomical purposes, aperture uh, is a, a severe constraint for CubeSats, and I, I believe that's why we haven't seen so many uh, applications in this domain. I mean, simply, um, the large telescopes would, would be every, everything you would want uh, 
in one system. But what may be possible um, in the future, I think particularly in, in radio astronomy, as I said, would be uh, interferometric arrays where we, where we might see big swarms of these actually being able to be doing something that big monolithic large uh, spacecraft could, could never achieve. Yeah. Very impressive so far, and trem oh, sorry. very, <laughs> very impressive so far, and tremendous potential, I'm sure. But there is inevitably an anxiety over the issue of orbital debris pollution. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, <laughs> uh, actually, I was I was doing uh, research in the orbital debris domain for. Uh, nearly a decade in the past, so I, I do know this subject very well. Um, there is this concern, of course, with the proliferation of the number of satellites. You're absolutely right. Um, however, uh, there have been actual studies uh, performed with the, um, the debris environment models, looking at the long-term evolution of the space debris environment. Um, I actually developed a model myself in the past and published research uh, on this subject in Acta Astronautica, on the impact of nanosatellites on the space debris environment. There have been some more recent studies in that, and the, the conclusion is actually um, provided that these small satellites comply, as with the rest of the sp space missions, on a post-mission lifetime of less than 25 years in low Earth orbit, we could actually launch up to about 400 per year without having a noticeable effect on the environment. So that's about the limit which is coming from the models today. Um, obviously, um, we've had launches of, of CubeSats. There's been one this year, actually, where over 100 CubeSats have been deployed in one go. So actually, we might start hitting that limit quite soon. And I think that would be the time to become concerned and uh, we'll have to, to look at, about what extra measures would then would need to be taken to, uh, to limit the impacts. But for the time being, we're in not a bad situation. Thank you. Microphone. You mentioned rendezvous with near-Earth objects, but would you have enough thrust to actually move any of them? <laughs> Um, that's also an interesting question because uh, I also published a paper on this topic, <laughs> again in Acta Astronautica. Um, you would need, in order to actually, um, uh, let's say, uh, deviate the, uh, the trajectory of, of, of uh, one of these large asteroids, Let, let's say you have, for example, an asteroid of about 100 meters in diameter. Um, you would need a spacecraft of around, uh, I think it was around 20 tons, and you would need to generate a power of around 200 kilowatts. Uh, and it provided you could land that on the surface, you could generate enough thrust about um, 20 years in advance of any potential impact. So um, that's about what we might expect with the so-called rendezvous land and push scenario. There have been other studies uh, also done, so-called kinetic energy impactor studies. So uh, actually, that's, that turns out to be more effective. Uh, but you need to actually do some quite exotic trajectories. And again, you need quite a lot of propulsion capability to um, deviate your trajectory such that you maximize the impact velocity and transfer as much kinetic energy as possible. But again, we're talking about spacecraft of, of uh, 10 to 20 tonnes, so it's really in a different scale of things. No, I'm afraid not. <laughs> okay, on that happy note, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>